And now let me officially welcome one and all on behalf of the NIOSH Future Work Initiative. Thank you for joining us during our inaugural webinar on the role of organizational design in the future of work. My name is Sarah Tamers and I will be your moderator. Now, before we jump into the anticipated content for today's webinar, I'd like to say a few words about the NIOSH Future of Work Initiative, which was launched in 2019 to address the ongoing and accelerated changes impacting the workplace and work, all of which present both challenges, but also opportunities for tomorrow's workforce. Our vision is quite simple and very much aligned with that of NIOSH, which is to prepare workers for a safer, healthier, and more productive future. Now, to tackle the novel and often complex issues that workers face, the initiative advocates using the total worker health approach, which is a synergistic, holistic, expanded, transdisciplinary, really, approach that aims to look at how the workplace and work impact and therefore can be modified to improve workforce outcomes, not just on, but also off the job. And the initiative very much is meant to be a collaborative effort made up of different parts and pieces and individuals, both within the walls of NIOSH and increasingly beyond as well. Now, one of the first steps we wanted to undertake with the initiative is to develop a set of future of work priority topics, as you see before you. This is the graphic that we developed. You see at the top, we have issues that impact all three of the workplace work and workforce. And then below to the left of your screen, top to down, you see our nine priority topics, each one to the right having its associated subtopics divided again into these three groupings of workplace work and workforce. And this was meant to be developed to serve as a guiding framework for research and practice activities. And if you'd like to learn more about our priority topics, I would encourage you to please take a look at our website as we have a foundational paper there that really outlines these in much more detail than we certainly would be able to cover in one webinar. Now, the NIOSH Future Work Initiative and Work Group have a number of ongoing and upcoming activities, including launching this very webinar series. We will be hosting three webinars a year, each year for the next three years, so a total of nine, each one focused on one of our nine priority topics, beginning, of course, today with organizational design. And as you see on your screen, the two additional ones we'll be focused on this year are artificial intelligence and demographics. And again, if you'd like to learn more about this series or the initiative, I encourage you to visit our website. Now, without further ado, let me please introduce you to your two speakers for today. First, we will hear from Dr. Jessica Streit. Jessica is a research psychologist and deputy director of the Office of Research Integration at NIOSH. Now in this role, she works closely with NIOSH's associate director, of research and integration to leverage innovation and promote strategic alignment and collaboration among both the intramural and extramural research communities to advance the NIOSH mission. Jessica also serves as a scientific program official for NIOSH's National Occupational Research Agenda Intramural Research Competition and is a member of NIOSH's Healthy Work Design and Wellbeing Cross-Sector Program. She has contributed to the development of a national occupational research agenda on healthy work design and well-being, as well as one on total worker health. Jessica completed a professional certificate in strategic foresight from the University of Houston just last year and has co-authored publications examining occupational safety and health risks and hazards faced by workers today and in the future of work. Second, we will hear from Dr. Leslie Hammer. Leslie is a professor in the Oregon Institute of Occupational Health Sciences at Oregon Health and Science University, as well as co-director of the Oregon Healthy Workforce Center, which is one of the six total worker health centers of excellence funded by NIOSH. She is also a professor of psychology at Portland State University and associate director of the Portland State University Occupational Health Psychology Graduate Training Program. She is a leading expert on work and family and occupational stress more generally, and serves regularly as a consultant on occupational stress and well being workplace issues. She specializes in the health effects of supportive supervision at work and the health consequences of occupational stress and work family conflict, and has extensive experience in designing, implementing, and evaluating worksite interventions and supervisor training. She conducts applied research 
that focuses on workplace interventions aimed at improving supervisor leadership skills and in turn, the impact of such trainings on both supervisor and worker performance, stress, health, safety, and well being. And with that, Jessica, thank you for joining us today. And let me turn this over to you, please. Great. So before I get started, Sarah, I just want to do a check and make sure you can hear me and see the slides. Indeed. Thank you, Jessica. You're good to go. Perfect. Well, thank you all for joining today. It's a pleasure to participate in NIOSH's inaugural Future of Work webinar and to present alongside Dr. Leslie Hammer to discuss the topic of organizational design, which is really an important concept that affects worker health, safety, and well-being today and will undoubtedly continue to do so into the future. For the next 15 minutes or so, I will talk a little about NIOSH's current organizational design priority topics for the Future of Work initiative, and I'll also describe NIOSH's current research portfolio in this critical occupational safety and health research area. But before I move on, I would like to offer special thanks to Dr. Naomi Swanson, who collaborated with me to author this presentation. So at its most fundamental level, the term organizational design refers to both the physical and functional infrastructures supporting the work that must be done. And these structures have a major influence on where, when, and how work will be performed. Historically, organizational design included a fixed work schedule at a dedicated facility where workers had direct supervision by a managerial chain from a single employer. And this was true for most occupations, regardless of their associated industry. Today, many workplaces and work schedules are more complex in design than this historic model, due in large part to advances in information communication technologies, sometimes called ICTs for short. The popularity and availability of ICTs like cellular phones and Wi-Fi enabled devices now make it possible for a significant number of jobs to be completed from almost anywhere at virtually any time of day. And consequently, remote working and teleworking or telecommuting have become more widely accepted practices. And in this past year, we saw a monumental surge in work from home arrangements during the COVID-19 pandemic. Many just-in-time research studies trying to get a grasp on work from home rates have occurred in the last 11 months, with estimates suggesting as much as 43% of the US workforce has been engaged in some type of home-based work arrangement since March, 2020. And 75% of executives surveyed have reported that these work from home experiences have been successful. Now, while some employers have already begun the shift toward in-office requirements for their workers, and many anticipate reinstituting in-person work for most, if not all, their employees at some point in the future, new studies also suggest that employers are more open now than they were pre-pandemic to the idea of blended work environments that include some mix of in-office and at-home work time. In fact, some recently published estimates indicate 16% or more of the US working population will continue to work from home on a regular basis, even after the pandemic passes and we re-equilibrate to a new normal. And while this figure may not seem impressive at first, it's certainly a considerable jump from the estimated 3.4% who regularly worked from home in 2019. And so with this information in mind, we can see that the future of work stands to become an increasingly complex mix of jobs, relying on a combination of traditional and flexible ways of working, which creates both challenges and opportunities for the occupational safety and health community. NIOSH's Future of Work initiative, like Sarah already mentioned, prioritizes the study of future organizational design driven challenges and opportunities into what can conceptually be collapsed into four main areas, the physical work environment, the work non-work interface, stress prevention, and organizational leadership. And so we'll spend the next few minutes looking at each of these in a little more detail. First, there is a strong body of literature substantiating the link between the physical work environment and worker well-being and organizational performance. Regardless of where or when or how they work, workers today need access to health protecting design features, such as ergonomically designed workstations and work tools, personal protective equipment, and hazard free work environments. And these needs will undoubtedly continue into the future. There are questions, however, around how safe working environments will be provided, maintained, and continually evaluated in the future of work, as our definition of what constitutes the workplace expands and the boundaries around what is considered the work environment become more and more fluid. There is evidence, for example, that remote workers may be at increased risk of injury because home offices are frequently configured without ergonomic review or consultation. 
In addition, remote workers are often unable to take advantage of health enhancing uh, features and opportunities that we might find in a well-designed central work facility. Offices set up in an individual worker's home or automobile are unlikely to include features like smart ventilation systems, work-related automated safety mechanisms, sit, stand, or active workstations, and comprehensive on-site exercise facilities. So without the requirement of reporting to a central facility with a cafeteria, workers' access to nutritious food options during workday meal and break times may also be more limited. In the future, as facilities are modernized or constructed and as workspaces become more flexible, employers and occupational safety and health professionals will need to think about creative strategies to promote health equity among all worker groups, regardless of where or when they work. And as the profile of the physical work environment continues to change, so too will the landscape of the work, uh, non-work interface. In coming years, it is anticipated that workers will face a growing need to concurrently manage work and personal life responsibilities. Recently, flexible work arrangements have become one of the most popular mechanisms for enhancing work-life fit. So much so that employers and workers may assume that flexible schedules will somehow be a magic cure-all for work-life balance and integration issues. In reality, research on the consequences of workplace flexibility have actually yielded mixed results. On one hand, a large number of studies highlight the positive effects of flexibility, including increased job performance, satisfaction, autonomy, creativity, and opportunities for historically disadvantaged groups. But on the other hand, multiple studies have also noted that more flexibility can exacerbate work-family conflict and increase work-related stress by further blurring the boundaries between the work and personal life domains. In addition, jobs consisting primarily of remote work often require intense use of information communication technologies, and it is easy for extended work availability to become normalized when employees are all equipped with mobile devices that are connected to an organization's network systems. So this can lead to increased feelings of telepressure, which is an unhealthy internal state characterized by a constant preoccupation with work. In recent studies, telepressure has been associated with increased burnout, elevated stress levels, and poor sleep practices among workers. There's also a fundamental difference in self-governed flexibility, which includes workers' abilities to vary their daily schedules and take leave as needed, and employer-sanctioned flexibility, which includes things like on-call work schedules. These two different forms of flexibility can have very different effects on workers' physical and mental health. Not surprisingly, more negative outcomes and greater work-life issues have been reported by on-call workers because this type of schedule fails to enhance worker control over the work experience and can actually make working hours far less predictable. Now, along with work scheduling, access to employer-sponsored leave, such as paid time off for vacations, illnesses, and dependent and elder care, plays a critical role in managing the work-non-work -work interface. There are a number of factors that influence workers' access to paid leave. A handful of examples are called out on the slide here, including work arrangements, occupation, industry, or profession, union presence and membership, employer size and location, and changes in employment status. In the future, paid leave programs stand to become even more complicated due to the rise of non-standard employment arrangements and multinational employers. We're also seeing an increasing number um, of job changes that a worker experiences in a lifetime. Today, the average worker holds 12.3 different jobs by age 52, and this number is projected to continue to grow into the future. Employment disruptions that are caused by these types of job changes can lead to considerable fluctuations in a worker's access to benefits like paid leave, including gap periods where the benefit is wholly absent, which have obvious work-life fit implications. So clearly, research evaluating the health effects of flexibility and access to employer-sponsored leave will be paramount in the future of work. Now, along with the work-non-work -work interface, work stress is another increasingly um, important safety, health, and well-being issue that is highly affected by organizational design factors. According to recent studies published by the American Psychological Association, approximately two-thirds of U.S. adults identify work as a significant source of stress. This is highly alarming due to the myriad of associated negative health outcomes, which range from psychological issues like burnout, anxiety, depression, and frustration, to physical ailments like back and headaches, sleep disturbances, fatigue, and digestive system malfunctions. Research suggests workers will experience more frequent and more intense emotional and mental stress from work in the future. 
Some of the major contributors to the growth of the work stress epidemic are anticipated to be an increased blurring of work-life boundaries, greater demands for work availability and flexibility, and decreased human connections due to remote working and the use of robots at work. So starting now and continuing into the future, we'll have a need for research investigating the antecedents and consequences of work stress. In addition, the critical need for studies that design, implement, and evaluate interventions to reduce and prevent work-related stress will almost certainly continue into the future. Uh, and as is true today, organizational leadership will continue to play a key role for worker safety, health, and well-being in the future. Optimistically, new ways of working will provide opportunities for innovative health promoting leadership strategies that can support and empower workers by demonstrating respect, appreciation and health awareness, by distributing rewards fairly, communicating clearly, and advocating for job control and autonomous decision making. And along similar lines, the importance of corporate social responsibility, which involves prioritizing societal interest over profits, will continue to grow into the future. In a competitive market fueled by limited resources, employers who embrace corporate social responsibility practices will be positioned to benefit from innovation, cost savings, brand differentiation, and engagement by both customers and employees. In addition, a growing body of research supports the role of corporate social responsibility as an important psychosocial risk management strategy because it enhances the quality of working life by supporting safe work environments and ethical labor practices, instituting diversity and inclusion policies, and providing workers with access to continuing education, community engagement opportunities, and affordable childcare. There are already a number of resources available for businesses and organizations who are interested in increasing the social responsibility of their operations, including the ISO 26000 social responsibility standard pictured here. So today's need for additional structured investigations and evaluations of worker and organization level outcomes associated with corporate social responsibility and other sustainability policies and practices will continue into the future. The publication and dissemination of such findings is critical to growing the evidence base in favor of this alternative way of approaching the process of doing business. So as we have seen, many organizational design priorities in the future of work will not be completely new or unanticipated hazards. Instead, they will be con continuations or extensions of psychosocial factors that are already recognized as salient today. And to that end, NIOSH has been building a strong portfolio of research on these priority topics for many years. Today, this research is part of NIOSH's Healthy Work Design and Wellbeing Program, a tripartite effort which addresses the domains of total worker health, work organization and stress-related disorders, and economics. And as noted on its webpage, the mission of NIOSH's Healthy Work Design and Wellbeing Cross-Sector Program is to protect and advance worker safety, health, and well-being by improving the design of work, management practices, and the physical and psychosocial work environments. The Healthy Work Design and Wellbeing Program sponsors NIOSH's priority strategic goal of promoting safe and healthy work design and well-being. This priority goal is currently supported by 15 intermediate goals, which specify desired actions on the part of external stakeholders using NIOSH research findings and outputs. These intermediate goals are dispersed across virtually all industry sectors and focus on topics such as non-standard work arrangements, stress, fatigue, musculoskeletal disorders, substance use and misuse, uh, worker mental health, obesity and other chronic diseases, and vulnerable worker populations. At present, NIOSH has 53 funded activities in the healthy work design domain. These include a variety of research, surveillance, intervention, and training activities across NIOSH's intramural and extramural research portfolios. And along with all other NIOSH research programs, Healthy Work Design and Wellbeing releases an annual one-page summary of highlights for those who would like to learn more about its recent accomplishments. In January 2020, the Healthy Work Design and Wellbeing Council, which is co-chaired by NIOSH research program leaders and external stakeholders, released the National Occupational Research Agenda for Healthy Work Design and Wellbeing. This document, which is available for free internet download, identifies the most relevant issues and research gaps in healthy work design and worker well-being that agencies and organizations across the nation should address through 2026. Those priorities are organized into seven objectives, which focus on changing worker demographics, work arrangements, technology and work, chronic health conditions, working hours and sleep, 
organizational practices, and the work non work interface. Additional information on NIOSH's Healthy Work Design and Wellbeing program is available from any of the links listed here. And we've included a list of the references that we consulted during the development of this presentation uh, for those who may be interested in reading more on any of the topics that we've discussed today so far. So with that, I will thank you all very much for your time and attention and turn the floor back to Sarah as our moderator for today. Thank you very much, Jessica. Well, now we will hear from Leslie. Leslie will give you a moment to get your slides squared away, but then the floor is yours. Thank you again for joining us. Sarah, can you see my slide? Because I actually had two different ones on my lap on my laptop. So I'm hoping I'm showing the right one. Can you see it? Yes, we can see it and we can hear you loud and clear. <laughs> okay. Well, let's hope this will be close. If if it's the wrong one, it only has one um, spelling error in it. So that's the only difference. Anyway, um, thanks so much for inviting me and I'm happy to be here. This is um, really exciting to be in this inaugural um, webinar on um, the future of work and specifically focusing on organizational design and which is really the area that is um, closest to my heart. Um, I will be talking today about my research and also about practice related to um, healthy work design. And now I'm going to try to advance forward, which is not happening. So let's see if I can do this. There we go. Perfect. So I am I am the co-director of the Oregon Healthy Workforce Center, as Sarah introduced me as, and really gave a wonderful um, description of, of my background. I'm also um, with Portland State University and the co-director, the associate director now of the um, Occupational Health Psychology Program. I'm part of the Oregon Institute for Occupational Health Sciences at Oregon Health and Science University as well. And so we are one of um, seven research institutes at OHSU. And so the Oregon Healthy Workforce Center is located within the institute. My co-director of the Oregon Healthy Workforce Center is Ryan Olson. And as I said, today I'm gonna to be talking about some research and then practice as well. Um, my background really has been in kind of a combination of focusing on work life, work family issues, and also supervisor training to support workers and help reduce stress and improve well being. And I have spent the past 15 years developing training and um, for supervisors, and that's what I'm really going to talk about today. So this comes at the, um, the Future of Work Initiative in um, focusing on healthy leadership, as well as work life, as well as reducing stress and burnout for employees. I really focus on prevention and that is important to, um, to realize that when we talk about leadership training, even though it's training of leaders, it is from an organizational perspective and it is considered a primary prevention. So in addition to um, the healthy leadership focus, I will then talk some more specifically about two projects. One is the Safety and Health Improvement Program, which was developed as part of the Oregon Healthy Workforce first um, cycle of funding. And then I'm going to talk about how we uh, adapted this for the U.S. Forest Service and further more broadly. And then I will be talking about some future directions. First of all, the importance of leadership training. I, I can't I really can't express how important this is because training leaders to be supportive of workers has shown to be a very critical mechanism for improving health and well being and decreasing stress of workers. And what I have done over the past 15 years is develop training with um, the help of 
of funding from NIH, from CDC, NIOSH, from the Department of Defense, and with the help of a lot of colleagues, um, developing training programs and then evaluating the effectiveness of those training programs using randomized control trials. And the training programs have focused on training leaders, supervisors, managers, on how to better support workers around different domains. The family supportive supervisor training was the first training that um, was developed um, with my colleague, Ellen Kosick. And we focused on training supervisors how to better support workers on work-life integration. And that led to improvements in job satisfaction, reductions in turnover, and also improvements in reports of um, physical health. From there, I developed the SHIP training, which is a safety supportive supervisor program training. It's really the um, safety and health improvement program that was part of the first cycle of the Oregon Healthy Workforce Center developed in collaboration with Donald Truxillo. And I'll talk more about that as I move ahead. And then the veteran supportive supervisor training was developed as part of the study of employment retention for veterans um, with the support of Department of Defense funding. There we developed training based on the prior two trainings and trained supervisors in civilian workplaces how to better support returning service members. And that then led into the military employees sleep and health study, the MESH study, where we developed sleep supportive supervisor training and integrated it with FSSB training. Currently, I'm involved in a, a study of active duty um, service members training them on really the supervisors, the, the, the really actually platoon leaders on how to better support their soldiers around um, psychological health and well-being. All of these programs have been very extensive. They've taken multiple years. They have developed training that is easily accessible and available now, and they have been done in conjunction with a large number of collaborators. As I mentioned, Ellen Kosick, um, Ryan Olson, Kent Anger, um, Cynthia Moore, Todd Bodner, Donald Truxillo, Tori Crane, Steve Shea, Jennifer Dimoff, Krista Brockwood, and many others, um, many other graduate students and postdocs. Um, the, this is important work because we really do show that aiming at the supervisor as primary prevention, teaching supervisors how to be better supportive in certain realms, certain domains, leads to improvement in health outcomes, well-being outcomes, safety outcomes for employees. So it reduces occupational stress, improve, improves well-being. And recently I wrote a chapter with two graduate students, Shailene Allen and Jordan Leslie, focusing specifically on how supervisor training um, can lead to improvements in employee health and well-being and reductions in stress. Again, a critical mechanism. So the Safety and Health Improvement Program, or SHIP, which as I said, was developed as part of the first cycle of the Oregon Healthy Workforce Center. The details of this actually can be obtained in um, publications, which I've listed at the end, um, as well as on our implementation website. And that website is yourworkpath.com. And this is part of the, our institute and our center. And you can access the different components of this and other training programs. We are, have developed toolkits to make them available to employers because we're at the intersection of science and practice. I'm not interested in just doing the science. So much of what's important to me is to make sure that this moves out and it gets used in workplaces to improve employees' experiences, workers' experiences at work. So there's a one-hour computer-based training as well as a two-week behavior tracking program, facilitated team sessions, and then follow-up discussions as part of this SHIP program. What we have found in our research um, and when we evaluated the effectiveness of SHIP, we found that it had direct effects, improvements on um, physical health in, the, in terms of blood pressure. We also found that it, had direct, that it had direct effects and moderating effects on employee outcomes. Moderating effects were actually that it was more effective 
when the leader member relationship or the leader member exchange as measured by L LMX was low. So if it they didn't have a, a very strong, um, very eff effective um, leader group relationship to begin with, this training was more effective. So it was more effective where there was need. And what we found is that when there was need, that greater need when LMX was low, we saw improved um, reports of family su supported supervisor behaviors by employees, improved reports of team effectiveness, and improved reports of work life effectiveness. Those publications are noted below as well. Since we developed this as part of the Oregon Healthy Workforce Center, part of our first cycle, we were then very interested in translating this to move forward in other, other um, realms. This was initially developed as um, with the city of Portland um, and there, there were municipal city workers in the Water Bureau and the Bureau of um, Portland Bureau of Transportation. Mostly they, were, they had um, jobs that were most similar to construction workers. So they were in the field, although they were permanent, they were, um, had, they were permanent positions in, um, in the city. We wanted to modify this and translate it for other more general types of occupations. And so we did that also as part of um, our work with the Oregon Healthy Workforce Center. And then what we did was we actually translated it for a specific use, translated it for the US Forest Service. So this resulted, this was really the, the result of um, some work that I had been doing with the Forest Service and with the safety director of our region six in the Forest Service. Forest Service. And we first conducted a needs assessment and to learn more about what the stressors were, what the experiences were of these um, forest service workers. They were in, they were working in the forest. Some of them worked on fires. Um, they had, uh, they had jobs that were really um, isolated. Uh, so the, if you see the, um, the items in red were really the, the variables that we focused on for the modification of ship. Um, we focused on these issues related to high stress, high work family stress. So we drew on the ship training, which drew on the family supportive supervisor be behavior training. Also, there was a need for more better communication. And then we found that there was also this, um, th these concerns over ambiguity and concerns over job demand and lack of, job demands and lack of information. So we adapted the ship training for the supervisor training team education program. I have lots of acronyms. This is how I keep track of these different training programs. STEP for the US Forest Service. And we actually um, adapted this um, with some um, funding that was supported by my institute, the Oregon Institute of Occupational Health Sciences. And by adapting, we added this role clarity module and we updated images within the training program. Um, we consolidated some content and removed some aspects and made it um, more, more appropriate for the forest service. So that training, the step training content involved still the um, elements of the family supportive supervisor behavior and the safety supportive supervisor behaviors, which were part of SHIP. And then we extended and developed this new module on role clarity. Again, all of this training is aimed at supervisors. And it's aimed at supervisors because we know that supervisors are key. They are key for primary prevention for reducing occupational stress improving health and well-being of workers. So with the STEP study that was actually conducted by a postdoc of mine who is now, um, now on her own, um, McKenna Perry, we were interested in examining the effects of the, um, the STEP intervention on both employees and supervisors outcomes. outcomes. So the prior intervention studies were all developed um, in randomized controlled trials. This was a quasi-experimental design because we had, um, weren't able to randomize forests, but we went into four forests. We were also exam um, interested in examining the effect of stress on supervisors um, 
own work and well being moderated by their levels of demands. If you recall from the needs assessment, there were high levels of demands reported by um, the forest workers. And that was not necessarily something that we had control over changing in the Forest Service. So we wanted to see what, what effect those demands had on the training itself. For this training, we, um, I, we worked with 125 different employees and 67 different supervisors across four forests of the US Forest Service across Oregon and Washington. They were mostly male and mostly non-Hispanic. As I said, it was a quasi-experimental design um, with two forests assigned to intervention and two assigned to controls, not randomized. Um, we conducted surveys first um, online and we went actually to the Forest Service meetings and tried to actually um, collect data we had we were successful at that, and then we also followed up with an online survey. Supervisors uh, conduct um, went through the training, which was again a computer-based training and behavior tracking. And what we found was again similar to some of our other findings that when we train these super supervisors, and then we extend with this modified kind of um, modified training now, kind of family supportive, safety elements, and clarity over their roles. To so this was an element of reducing role ambiguity. Employees reported lower psychological distress and fewer concerns about forest safety. So again, when we train the supervisors, we see outcomes important to employees. Now, this was interesting because we also were interested in um, examining the effects on the supervisors. And what we found was that the supervisors actually reported lower organizational commitment and higher work family conflict. And we haven't really looked at what the training effects have on supervisors very often in the research that I've been doing. Um, what this tells us, we need to be paying more attention to supervisors. We also found that um, burnout was lower, especially for those supervisors who reported high baseline job demands. I'll be talking now about the implications. First of all, um, we adapted SHIP, and this is an effective way of improving health, safety, and well being of employees, and it can be across diverse um, occupations. So we adapted it first to be more general, and then, then we adapted it slightly for the, um, for the Forest Service. We also know now, and probably before the, these findings, um, if we really were paying attention, that we need, to, we need to be paying attention also to the supervisors and the managers. So, Developing um, leadership and helping leaders develop their support for workers to help reduce stress of workers is important, but we also don't want to stress out the leaders when we're doing it. So we need to be considering how not to overburden leaders with this training. In, in terms of um, future research, what can we do? We need to we need to really study how how to develop training that's going to be beneficial for workers and also beneficial for leaders. And when I talk about leaders, let me just clarify: we've looked at frontline supervisors, managers, and those are primarily primarily, and then sometimes higher level leaders. But leadership can be in um, encompassing all of these different levels, and it's important to consider. The different levels of leadership, but also understand that sometimes they have, they may have differential um, receptivity to the training and differential impacts um, of the training on employees. Implement, implementation and dissemination, as I said, this is critical. So I can tell you right now, this training is effective. I've been developing the trainings over the past 15 years, evaluating them in rigorous rigorous randomized control trials, and then also then developing training that is specific to different domains, domains of health, domains of safety, domains of work-life stress. And each of those, when we've adapted it, 
show to be effective. So we need to be disseminating this information. We need to be getting it out. And as scientists, sometimes that's difficult to do. In our institute, we have a whole outreach group that is responsible for connecting and disseminating and um, sharing the tools and toolkits we um, develop in our center. And that yourworkpath.com um, website that I shared um, earlier, is, uh, much of this is available. So I'm very interested in making sure that we do develop and tailor our tools and toolkits to make them accessible for employers. And I'm interested in understanding how employers are, are um, more interested in, in um, buying into certain types of toolkits and tools over others. This is consistent with NIOSH's um, research to practice initiative. So one example um, of what we've been doing lately is um, working with Safe, Safe Corporation. Safe Corporation is a total worker health affiliate. There's a, they're the workers comp insurance company in Oregon, the primary workers comp insurance company in Oregon. And we have been developing a version of SHIP that is general and adapted for SAFE so that they can use it as part of what they're calling a new leadership project. And it's to make trainings available um, to their policy holders and advocated and, and shared by, um, by their, um, their, their team at SAFE with the policy holders. So SHIP will soon be moving into um, the hands of the policy holders and availability, um, be available to policy holders um, through SAFE Corporation, which there are many. And we'd love to do this with other, other um, organizations. So dissemination and translation um, through, we're working with um, human resource associations, uh, ASSP, and other organizations to make sure that organizations, workplaces know about the availability of these trainings, which are primarily, again, free and available to use. Um, finally, I wanted to mention that um, also we try to make sure that we're not just publishing academic papers, but we're publishing lay papers. So um, an example is the conversation article that my colleague Lindsay Alley and I um, wrote probably back in about April. So it was at the start of COVID because we realized that the work that we're doing around supervisor training is absolutely critical in light of COVID. Supervisors need to understand that workers are going through extreme levels of stress, whether they are essential workers required to come on, um, be on site, or if they are working at home trying to manage work with school age children, um, whether they have a spouse that's lost a job. And so training supervisors to be more empathetic and supportive of workers during COVID is critical. Um, we wrote about this in the conversation. We actually developed a very quick, it's a um, micro training, a five minute micro training on pandemic response um, training for supervisors around this support. Um, COVID, we, is, is, it's, been, it's been impactful for all of us. And what we are currently doing is we're also evaluating the effectiveness of these trainings um, at, with through follow-up uh, evaluations during COVID of workers, because I believe that training supervisors to be more supportive will actually help to mitigate some of these negative psychological um, experiences um, and effects that people are having as a result of COVID. As I close, I just want to mention um, the Oregon Healthy Workforce Center has right now four toolkits that are available through yourworkpath.com and uh, the Safety and Health Improvement Program, Be Super, Promoting Youth Through Safety, and the Compass Program. And we have two more that will be uh, coming out soon. Again, feel free, visit yourworkpath.com um, to access our tools and toolkits. They're available, they're downloadable, and we're also available to, um, to support any questions and consultation. And that is all for me. I would invite you to follow um, the Oregon Healthy Workforce Center through social media. 
And I want to mention, I also have some of the citations here. Um, they were in the presentation and I'm happy to share the presentation with anybody. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Great, thank you very much, Leslie, for that presentation. I'm going to reshare. And so we have arrived uh, at our Q&A portion. We looks like we have about uh, 13 to 14 minutes for any questions for those of you who have them. If you haven't posed a question you would like to, certainly now is the time. Again, don't forget to use that uh, box that you have. You should have a little Q&A box where you can just type it in and, and we can try to, to get that answered for you today. So one question uh, that came in, uh, this seems uh, like it's, it would be for Jessica, and it is, can you please share industry-specific guidelines on organizational design roadmap and strategies? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, so as I mentioned in the presentation, as I was going through the NIOSH strategic plan and health, the healthy work design strategic goal, um, NIOSH's research portfolio is organized by 10 industry driven sectors and then seven cross cutting health and safety outcome driven um, cross sectors, which of which healthy work design is one of the latter. Um, but construction is one of those former industry based sectors and that program has an entire very rich web page devoted to construction specific um, resources and they have information on things like work arrangements, small business, green jobs, and a variety of other topics. Um, so that might be a good place to look for that type of industry specific information. Um, in addition, NIOSH has the National Construction Center at CPWR, the Center mm -hmm. for Construction Research and Training, and they're also a great resource for that industry specific information. Great, thank you, Jessica. Next we have, and, and this could be for either one of you, certainly uh, with your backgrounds, what does the research say about worker stress when working in the blended environment? Uh, go ahead, Leslie. I'm, I'm gonna, well, I'm, I'm gonna interpret blended environment. <laughs> I'm not, I, I think it's the, it's the blend of work from home and work at the central yes. facility as I referenced it in the presentation. Yes, yeah, that, do you yeah. wanna go ahead? That's what I was, do you want to? Or uh, well, I was going to say, I think for the most part, a lot of the research that exists on the benefits of telecommuting really has been done with samples that represent blended worker populations because 100% remote work is still really atypical, especially in the United States. Um, and so there are studies that suggest that working from home, even part-time or, or working from a preferred location, even part-time can have benefits for things like increased job satisfaction, quality of life, um, and decreased stress and even um, potential decreases in depression. Um, but typically these are studies with small samples. And so as the blended work environment becomes more popular, um, potentially, you know, now that we've lived through and have some at least anecdotal evidence that work from home can be effective um, during the COVID pandemic, there'll be more opportunities to really build that evidence base for a variety of worker populations and on a variety of different blended schedules. Great, thank you. Here's one. Uh, I'm going to read this. Uh, it's, it's a great question, but bear with me. I'm concerned that there will be all these subcontractor deploy from your home types models that emerge like construction or Uber. In those cases, you don't really have leadership in the same way that we are used to. So a lot of safety issues will be lost because you have hundreds or thousands of unique work sites and work locations. So it's hard to have a robust hazard assessment and policies that cover all of the hazards. So how do you lead safety and health issues when you can't even use the tools that we have always used to keep people safe? It seems that NIOSH needs to start developing the tools and resources needed to support the new model of work arrangements that Jessica presented on. That's a, yeah, that, that's, I think, I mean, I don't think it's a question. I think it's a statement and I think it's a really, really important um, statement. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it, it looks like Emily, Emily Haas is, is absolutely correct. Um, this is, this is something that, that is still needed. We don't quite understand how we're going to be able to um, necessarily 
provide risk models and risk assessment, risk um, reduction models when people are so dispersed, when there are not, not um, direct leaders, and there are going to have to be responsibilities at certain levels of organizations um, for individuals because, and, and for implementing um, you know, safety trainings and the way that um, we approach these issues. Um, I think that, you know, I mean, NIOSH definitely is, that's part of what this program is all about is to really spur and put attention to um, these types of alternative types of jobs that are really coming up. Um, this is what, this is what's happening in the future. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, Leslie. Um, next, let's go to how has moving across state lines impacted these studies? Well, I think it's one of those you know, factors that we see not only moving across state lines, but if we think from a more global perspective about multinational companies, anytime you have the employer situated in a context that's different from the environment or the context in which the worker is situated, so be that different states or different countries, that can impact um, worker need and cause a potential mismatch between employer what employers provide in terms of benefits and then what workers are requesting or feel like would really support their, their life and their quality of life. And, um, and so I think that this concept will continue to become more complex mm -hmm. as not only do we see companies where because of remote working employees can, if it's a US based organization, for example, employees can be in, in any state, but we also then will have multinational companies where the parent company is in a completely different country. You know, we have those models now, but the, all of the, the future oriented literature suggests that that's only going to continue to grow as we have a more and more global economy. Um, and so it's really sort of a, a cutting edge issue that requires more attention. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, we have another question here. Uh, do you have any research, do you know of any research on onboarding new employees and acclimatizing employees to new work teams, areas, or roles? I can take that one. Um, there is there is research on onboarding. There's actually um, I, I would suggest uh, taking a look at Talia Bauer's research B A U R um, B A U E E R. Mm -hmm. She has um, focused on onboarding and socialization. And then Ryan Olson is currently working on, my colleague is currently working on a study of um, onboarding practices for new bus operators. Mm -hmm. But onboarding is, is definitely a, um, an important area and that we need to definitely orient new employees to the safety um, requirements of jobs, to the culture, and to really the, the overall, the overall team, um, team experience in order to alleviate some of the stress that they're experiencing as they enter new jobs and also help orient them more so that they have the skills, both the psychological background and the, um, and the safety skills that will prepare them for, um, for the new jobs. But I would definitely look into um, Talia Bauer's work. Okay, great. Uh, next we have, are there any comparable trainings for supervisors available in the marketplace? How would you assess the marketplace in terms of which kinds of training products are most popular and how they are assessed by those who use them? There are, so in terms of the trainings that, um, that I presented on are training supervisors around how to support workers. Mm -hmm. And it's really theoretically based in social support theory and conservation of resources theory, which is the idea that when supervisors understand their kind of people um, power and how they, how they do have a lot of power over workers and employees and that they can actually use that power to a positive degree by supporting workers um, and how that is a very important mechanism for leading to improvements in um, health and safety and well-beings. I, 
I am not familiar with any other trainings that focus on really developing super supervisor support in this way. But the trainings that I have um, are is a, are available um, in the marketplace, I guess, or they're, well, they're not being sold. We're, they're available through us. <laughs> so I think that's that that is what is available. Okay. Is it the employee or employer who is financially responsible for the ergonomic equipment while teleworking, i.e. workstations, desks, and chairs? This is something that has come up. Yeah, well, I would say com common practice right now is that the employee bears the responsibility for any costs incurred for the home work environment. Um, there aren't any regulations about whether it's an employer or employee responsibility when you have that remote work situation mm -hmm. um, for the most part is managed I think at the organizational the organizational level um, will there be any type of, of formal policy or regulation about that in the future I think it stands to be determined um, but for now there isn't any anything that I'm aware of so uh, yeah, so, so some employers are are taking they do see it as their responsibility, but right the regulate it's not it's not regulated. But I do know that some employers do take on that responsibility because they they are progressive employers and they understand that if they if they help out in terms of um, you know ergonomic issues and make sure that their employees have the appropriate work um, workspaces at home that that will eventually also lead to a reduction in healthcare costs for the employer. Mm -hmm. um, uh, another problem that with all of this work, work at home is that so many, so, I mean, not just do people not have the appropriate um, desk settings or, or chairs, but I mean, space, as I think we, you know, we've talked about, I mean, the space, I mean, I know that there, people are working out of, out of closets. I mean, people are, people do not have appropriate space at home. So s working at home is great for some people and it's not great for others. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes, that's, we could have a very lengthy conversation about that. Um, and here, I believe uh, this will be the last question that we can address. Uh, thank you for sharing your professional expertise on the future of work. The importance of supervisor training rings true. Have your efforts investigated strategies or research for return to work strategies as telework may minimize ahead? And any research that you can point to regarding shared workplace in a blended environment given COVID shared space concepts may raise health and safety concerns given social distancing. I, I actually, I have I thought about the training around return to work strategies. I think that's really important. Um, I have not gone there yet, um, but anticipate, anticipate heading in that direction. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of research to support regarding the um, shared workspace and the blended environment. I mean, I, I, I'll leave that to Jessica if you want to answer that particular one. Well, I think there's general sort of hot desking research out there about sharing workspaces and how even pre-COVID there were challenges around, you know, the design of a shared space, especially from an ergonomics perspective. What works for one person doesn't necessarily work for another. And so there were already noted limitations to those hot desking type models. Um, I haven't seen any, any systematic research really that's um, talked about that environment post COVID or even during the pandemic while employers are planning to bring people back to work. You know, the, the research that I've seen suggests that most employers plan to have at least some portion or the majority of their workforce back in a centralized facility um, in the summer. That seems to be a common goal. So the June, July, 2021 timeframe. Um, but I haven't seen anything come out in terms of specific guidelines for sharing those workspaces from a okay. communicable disease perspective. Yeah, we could talk about this endlessly. Well, I'm afraid that we're all out of time. I'm sorry that we didn't get to a couple of the questions. Please feel free to contact us separately. Uh, another warm thanks, of course, to Jessica and Leslie for their thoughtful presentations today, to Sarah Mitchell and Kiana Harper for their technical assistance, and of course, to all of you, our attendees, who joined us for our first uh, NIOSH Future of Work initiative webinar on the role of organizational design in the future of work. Again, we have a series of webinars planned and lots to learn about the initiative. If you'd like to do so, you have the uh, address to visit. Certainly, we hope to see you again, and until then, please stay safe, healthy, and well. Bye-bye, everyone.